The 39 Steps by John Buchan Retold for audio by Kieran McGovern Chapter 1 I was born in Scotland, but my father took me to Southern Africa at the age of six. Throughout my childhood, my dream was to return to live in the old country. But now, after three months in London, I was bored. Richard Hannay, I told myself, you've got into the wrong ditch, my friend. It's time to climb out. Here I was, 37 years old. I had money and good health. But I was tired of London, tired of life. I walked back to the flat I was renting in Portland Place. The night was fine and clear. I envied the shop girls and the clerks I passed on the pavement. At least they had something to do. At Oxford Street, I looked up into the spring sky. I will stay in England one more day, I promised myself. If nothing happens, I will take the next boat back to South Africa. My flat was on the first floor in a new block. I put my key in the lock of my front door. Suddenly, a man appeared at my shoulder. He was slim with a short brown beard. He had small, bright blue eyes. I recognised him from an earlier meeting on the stairs. He had recently moved into the flat above me on the top floor. Can I speak to you? He said. He was trying to keep his voice calm. His hand was touching my arm. May I come in for a minute? I got the door open and he followed me in. After fastening the chain on the door, A murder? Who? The little man lowered his voice. Do you know the name? Constantine Karolides. I sat up at the name Karolides. I had been reading about this gentleman in the Times that very afternoon. He is the man trying to keep us at peace, Scudder continued. Without Karolides... There will be war. That's why they plan to kill him and me. Why you? I asked. Because I am the only man who can stop them. I mixed Mr Scudder another drink. On the 15th of June, Karadidis is coming to London, he said. They plan to kill him here. He told me more, but it was difficult to understand. Why don't you tell the police, I said, or warn Karolides? The police don't believe me, he said. The little man drank more whiskey. I thought I was safe here in London, he said. Then I saw two men standing in the street outside this block. I recognise one of them. What did you do? I asked. I watched them from my window, said Scudder. The man I recognised came in. He spoke to the porter. About what? I don't know. But I think he is here to kill me. That's why I need you to hide me. He sat there, blinking like an owl. I was starting to like the little chap. I trusted him. You can stay here for the night, I said. I'll lock you in this room and keep the key. But I warn you, Mr Scudder, don't try any tricks. I have a gun and I'm prepared to use it. For two days, Scudder stayed in my back room. In his notebook, he wrote a list of all the days until June the 15th. He ticked off each day with a red pencil. In the evening, we played chess. 
he beat me easily. On the third day, he began to get nervous again. That evening, I went out to dinner with a business contact. I came back about half past ten for our chess game. I had a cigar in my mouth as I pushed open the back room door. The light was off. Had Scudder already gone to bed? I flicked the switch, but there was nobody there. Then I saw something in the far corner which made me drop my cigar. My guest was lying on his back. There was a long knife through his heart. Chapter 2 I sat down in an armchair, feeling sick to my stomach. It was some minutes before I could look at Scudder again. His face was white, but at peace. I covered it with a tablecloth. I looked at my watch. It was half past ten. What was I going to do? I was in serious trouble, that was clear. Would Scudder's enemies come back to kill me? Almost certainly. Could I go to the police? No, they would never believe me. I would be charged with murder. I thought of that pale, dead face. I am an ordinary sort of fellow. I'm not braver than other people. But though I was in danger of my life, I knew my duty. Scudder died trying to protect your country, I told myself. Only you can now continue his work. You have to try and save Carolides. I searched Scudder's pockets. The trousers held only a little penknife and a few loose coins. In the side pocket of his jacket there was an old crocodile skin cigarette case and a cigar holder. There was no notebook. I looked around and saw that the room was a mess. All the drawers of every cupboard had been pulled out. The killer had been searching for something. Perhaps the notebook. I got out a map of the British Isles. Where could I hide until the 15th of June? Scotland was the obvious choice. My parents were Scottish. I could speak with the accent of a local. I chose Galloway, a remote area close to the border with England. Few people lived there. My Bradshaw's rail guide informed me that there was a train leaving St Pancras at ten past seven. But first I needed to leave Portland Place without alerting Scudder's killers. Thinking on this, I went to bed. I slept for two troubled hours. When I woke, it was nearly five. I opened my bedroom shutters. The faint light of a fine summer morning filled the sky. I took a bath and shaved. Then I got dressed in an old tweed suit and some boots. I filled my pockets with what I would need. Money, a toothbrush, a spare shirt. I had breakfast, a whiskey and soda and some biscuits from the cupboard. By this time it was nearly 6.30 and I still did not have a plan of escape. I put a pipe in my pocket. I filled my pouch with tobacco from a jar on the table by the fireplace. As I poked into the tobacco, my finger touched something hard. It was Scudder's little black notebook. A moment later, I heard the sound of milk cans 
rattling together in the distance. The milkman? He would soon be delivering milk to our building. Suddenly I had an idea. I went back to where Scudder lay. Goodbye, old chap, I said. I'm going to do my best for you. Wish me well, wherever you are. At quarter to seven, the milkman stopped outside Portland Place. I opened the front door and gestured for him to come inside. The milkman was wearing his uniform, a white coat and a flat blue cap. Yes, sir. Would you like to earn yourself a sovereign? I showed him a gold coin. His eyes lit up. What would you want me to do? He asked. Just lend me your uniform and a couple of milk cans for a few minutes. Why do you? I haven't got time to explain, I interrupted. But I promise you, you'll have everything back in less than half an hour. How will you get them back to me? I'll leave your uniform and the milk cans in the churchyard of St John's Church on Newton Street. You can collect them from there. I came out of the building, imitating the milkman's walk and whistle. Then I took the first turning into Newton Street. There was nobody around. The clock of the church struck seven. My train was in ten minutes. I quickly changed in the churchyard, leaving the cans and uniform where the milkman could find them. I walked away from the church and turned into Euston Road. The clock at Euston Station showed 7.05. I raced into St Pancras Station. There was not time to buy a ticket. Which platform? I looked up. Glasgow, stopping at Watford. Platform 3. A guard was already blowing the first whistle. Another stood at the platform barrier. The train has departed, one shouted as he tried to block me. I dodged his outstretched arms. The second whistle blew. There were shouts behind me. The train was moving. I ran alongside it. Somehow, I clambered into the last carriage. Chapter 3 The train travelled north all morning. It was fine May weather. There were flowers in the fields. At Leeds, a station guard walked along the platform. Please leave the train, he shouted. There will be a short delay. Nobody knew what was happening. Had the police sent a telegram to the station? Down by the platform rail, a policeman was talking to a station guard. Was it about me? Stay calm, Hanny, I told myself. Keep to your plan. I bought some lunch and a newspaper from a stall on the platform. Then I returned to my seat. Sitting opposite me were two gentlemen in business suits. I carefully opened the newspaper. The front page headline was Balkans Crisis, Archbishop to visit Sarajevo. On the back there was a list of horses running in the derby. There was also news about the beginning of the cricket season. From the corner of my eye I saw the man opposite me looking closely at my paper. I hoped it was the sport attracting his attention. All aboard, cried the railway guard, walking down the platform. The train is about to depart. From my carriage window, I could see the policeman was coming through the ticket barrier. He had a piece of paper in his hand. A telegram from Scotland Yard, perhaps? The guard blew his whistle. The policeman began to run. 
He called out something, but it was lost in the sound of the train engine. The guard did not hear him. The whistle sounded for the second time. The policeman was now running, but the train was moving. I kept my head in my newspaper. Finally, the train pulled out of the station. I looked at the door, expecting it to stop at any moment. I was ready to jump out onto the track. But the train gathered speed and we left Leeds behind. My carriage companions got out at Burnley. The man reading my newspaper looked back at me as he left. Did he know something? Surely the news was not yet public. Yet why had the policeman come onto the platform at Leeds Station? I checked the newspaper carefully. There were two murder reports. Neither occurred in London. In the foreign news section, there was a story about the Carolides peace plan. I tried to read it, but couldn't stay awake. I took out Scudder's notebook. Inside was a strange combination of numbers and words. From my time in the army, I knew this was a code based on the numbers. I tried to find a pattern without success. Then I fell asleep. When I woke, we were arriving at another station. I looked down the platform. No sign of any police. There was a man with a kilt though. I called out to him. Which station is this, my friend? Am I in Scotland? Carlisle, he said. You'll be there in an hour. I changed trains at Dumfries, taking a local service to Galloway. On the platform, there was a crowd of hill farmers. They were coming home from the market. We crowded into the third-class carriages of the old train. It travelled slowly through little woods and open moors. In the distance, there were the famous locks or lakes Further north, there were hills. The men smoked and talked about the market. Many smelt of whisky. They showed no interest in me. At about five o'clock, my carriage emptied. I got out at the next stop, a tiny and remote station in the middle of nowhere. All around was moorland. <laughs> 